Sweet. All right. So as I was saying before, um, <clears throat> we're going to go over polyatomic ions a little bit um, and talk a little bit about nomenclature, answer any questions you guys still have outstanding from last week's um, from last week's homework, because I know that there was a, a lot of practice there and a lot of um, finer points that were a little tricky. Um, so we'll go over nomenclature one more time, and then we'll start getting into uh, chemical reactions. We'll, and we'll review a little bit of uh, Vesper stuff too. That has to do with your guys' questions from the, um, from the quiz. Uh, I'm not fully uh, done with everybody's um, everybody's quizzes yet. So if I haven't, if I don't answer your question, feel free to jump in if it seems appropriate or just hang, um, hang on until I get done grading everything and, and we'll either, I'll either respond in your quiz or uh, we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Um, so for starters, nomenclature and lab related question, there were two compounds you didn't have to come up with a name for at the end of last week's lab. Uh, it was H2CO3 and H3Br. We don't really have it, um, a good way for naming compounds like, like either of those at this point. Um, we could call H2CO3 just hydrogen carbonate, except hydrogen carbonate was its own polyatomic ion that only had one hydrogen attached to it. Then we had, um, so it was HCO3 with a negative one charge. Um, and it's polyatomic ion, so we wouldn't want to name, name it with something with any of those prefixes like we would use for a covalent compound. Um, so we wouldn't name it dihydrogen carbonate. Um, so turns out if you have an, what looks like an ionic compound, um, but your positive charge is hydrogens, um, that's actually what an acid is. So we actually have a separate naming system for acids. Um, so this would actually be carbonic acid, um, which is also why um, carbonated drinks taste diff carbonated water tastes different than regular water. Um, it's because some of the CO2 that's dissolved into the water when you carbonate water uh, actually reacts with the water to make carbonic acid, which is what why it tastes sharper, why it's got that acidity to it um, when you drink uh, soda water. Um, so we'll talk about naming acids uh, later, once we get a handle on our first two nomenclature systems. Um, and then this other one, CH3Br, um, that's actually an, an organic compound, uh, meaning carbon-based. And organic compounds have a way more robust naming system because it turns out there's lots of different ways you can combine hydrogens and carbons with the same formula. And we needed to have a name to be able to, to distinguish things that have the same formula, but are different compounds. Um, so with that in mind, the organic nomenclature is much more, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I can say it's much more complicated um, than uh, the, the nomenclature systems we're learning so far, um, which is why it takes about a whole year of organic chemistry before you really feel comfortable naming organic um, compounds. Um, so this, the, the name for this one would be bromomethane, um, but we're not going to actually learn that naming system in this class. Um, do we have any resources for decoding what the periodic table is truly saying? Um, I, the problem with this question, so this was about the periodic table. Is there any, any other ways to think about the periodic table? Um, any other tools for visualizing things. Um, the problem is that the periodic table is based entirely around electron configurations, really. Um, and so if you think about your periodic table in terms of the electron configurations, that kind of explains all the other periodic trends that we see. Um, and there are, there are numerous, numerous applications of, of the structure of the periodic table, we've only scratched the surface by talking about ionization energy and atomic radius. Um, but everything is going to come back to energy levels, protons, and valence shell. 
Um, so, so that's really your best way for thinking about it. And that's why we're, we're going to always come back to it and think about it in terms of electron configurations and energy levels. Um, is there an easier way to visualize molecular geometry from the Lewis dot structure? No, practice. Um, the, the more you get used to being able to picture these shapes, these geometries in your head, um, meaning you see, you know, sort of seeing them in three dimensions or even building them in, in something like last week's lab um, simulation and being able to click and drag and move them around, the more you'll be able to sort of um, understand and in, intuitively be able to look at a formula and say, oh, I know what that geometry is going to be, but it just, it takes practice. Um, you know, the, you know, probably the 10th time that you see CH4 as a molecule and have to draw it as a tetrahedral structure, you'll probably start to be able to just look at the formula and know what the structure is or be able to see it visually. Um, but it's just something that takes, takes practice because it's a completely foreign concept for most people, um, especially with atoms being as abstract of an idea as they are. Um, parentheses in nomenclature. So oops, there's a couple places where we use parentheses in nomenclature. So I thought it'd be worth reiterating some of these. Um, so if we're writing out the names of, a, of an ionic compound, that parenthesis was there to tell us we were talking about a specific charge on a transition metal, right? So if I wrote something like, Well, we we'll use the one from from the uh, quiz. Vanadium three. The parentheses in that case are just indicating where, that the three is referring to the charge on the vanadium. So that's telling us we're talking about V with the three plus charge. Right. The other place that I think is is probably what this what this person was asking for more um, than than those parentheses is in our formulas. When we have polyatomic ions in our formulas, we use the parentheses if we have more than one of those polyatomic ions as a way of basically making it explicitly clear I'm talking about this polyatomic ion. So, for instance. Um, if we had, well, we can, we can continue on with the same one. If we had vanadium three nitrate, um, vanadium three nitrate would be V. So, so vanadium three plus would be our first ion. And then nitrate is NO three with a negative one charge. So most of you so I gave you the, the formula and you guys had to come up with a name on the quiz, right? But if we had the name and you were going to the formula, you would look at it and say, okay, vanadium with the three plus charge and nitrate has a negative one. So I need three nitrates. So we would use the parentheses to indicate, we put a parentheses around NO3 and then a three after the parentheses to say, hey, this is nitrate, it's NO3 and there's three of them. Right, so it would it would look something like V N O three three. Right, so in this case, that three that's outside the parentheses is saying you have three of everything inside the parentheses, but we don't just distribute it like we like we might in a math class. We don't distribute that three and say. N309, because there are a lot of ways when you have that many atoms, that many covalent um, bonds, there are a lot of different ways you can arrange things that are going to be, that might be different from one another. It's so rather than saying N309, um, which could be misinterpreted a number of different ways, we specifically say NO3, and then we have three of them. Um, it's, so it's, it's just a little bit more explicit that way. 
And you don't need it around all of them. If you only have one of your polyatomic ions, you don't need to put the parentheses around it and say one. Um, and so it's, it's a bit of a, a, just the convention. This is the way that we usually write it. Um, and it's, it's really to, to try and avoid confusion. As confusing as this looks like, as this looks, um, this is better than the confusion that we would get if nobody knew whether you were talking about nitrate or some other nitrogen oxygen compound. Can I ask you something? Yes, please. It kind of relates to this. I was confused by like the mixed compound ones where you put like, did like tetranitrate or pentanitrate, or if you put the Roman numerals in between and said, like, I had a hard time like differentiating that. Yes. So let me, and I'll come back to this in a second, but just let me, this is skipping forward, way forward. Um, just to get to this sort of overview um, of nomenclature, this flow chart. It, and again, I know this looks confusing, but the this first distinction of ionic versus covalent is the most important one. And ionic means that you've got something with a positive charge and something with a negative charge. And we're just going to make those charges cancel out to zero and say the name of each ion. Right, so for that vanadium three nitrate example we had, vanadium is a metal, but has a positive charge. Uh, nitrate's a negative charge. It's a non-metal. It's a polyatomic ion. So, if we say vanadium three, that tells us what the charge is on the vanadium, and nitrate by definition has its own charge as well. So, just saying vanadium three nitrate is all the information you need when it comes to ionic compounds. With covalent compounds, there are sometimes multiple ways you can combine non-metals together. And so that's why we use those prefixes. We're only going to use those prefixes if we're talking about a covalent compound, right? So not tri, di, tetra, penta, et cetera. We're only going to see those if it's a covalent bond. Because if it's an ionic bond, just knowing the charge on each of them is all you really need. Right, because we're always just trying to make it add up to zero. That was my question too. How, what is the differentiation between an ionic compound, I mean, an ionic element and a covalent compound? So it would be those, that prefix set, right? From, from the naming, so as far as looking at a formula and telling what you're dealing with, mm -hmm. if you can look at the formula and say, oh, I've got a metal and then I've got a polyatomic, or I've got a metal and a non-metal, that right there, that's your distinction. That tells you it's ionic. If you can look at point, part of the molecule of the formula and say that's a positive charge and the other another part and say that has a negative charge, then that's going to be your distinction. And there's, Between that and covalent. Bonds. Exactly, covalent compounds. If it's covalent all non-metals, then okay. it's almost always going to be a covalent compound. There's really only one exception to that. Um, let me skip forward one more time. Um, looking at these polyatomic ions, there there's basically only one positive, positively charged polyatomic ion on this list, and that's ammonium. Um, so what the reason I'm pointing that out is it's possible to have an ionic compound with no metals in it if if you have ammonium present because that could be your positive charge and then you could have anything else as your negative charge and it's still ionic but with that exception every ionic compound is going to be a metal and a non-metal or a metal and a polyatomic ion Right. This is about the only time you can have all non-metals and still have it be an ionic compound is if um, you have an ammonium present. I have a quick question um, about yeah. the polyatomic ions. So are all the polyatomic ions non-metals? 
or it's a metal. There are, there are a few of them that have some metals mixed in with them. So chromate, okay. for instance. Yeah. Um, chromate, for instance, has chromium, which is a metal, but it's also surrounded by oxygens. And it's basically, the these are the most common polyatomics. Are, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other polyatomics out there. You can have aluminates, for instance, and a lot of minerals and geology um, actually has a lot of polyatomic ions that are based around things that aren't on here. Um, I'm trying to think, let's see, where's my periodic table? Um, you have uh, nickels. Nickels and cobalts can make polyatomic ions pretty easily. Um, those would be probably the, the most common. Molybden, molybdenum can actually make polyatomic ions. They call them molybdenates. Mm -hmm. um, so this, all that just to say that, that it's not a polyatomic ion. It's just basically classified as here's a group of atoms that stick together pretty well, and it has a charge. Okay. That's sort of our, our overall definition of a polyatomic ion is just these things are relatively stable, but they also have a charge. So they can make these polyatomic um, or they can make these ionic compounds. While we're here, Sean, can you also expand on what makes the suffix like the I eight Y? Yes. Thank you. Yes, that was actually on my list of things to go through today. Um, oh, and no, so it's perfect. Um, so the, the polyatomic ions that end in eight tend to be the most stable and the most common. And so basically when they were coming up with these names, um, they just said, okay, well, this is the most common polyatomic that has nitrogen in it. So we're going to call it nitrate. Um, the, however, that's not the only polyatomic that has nitrogen. And so the difference between eight and eight is usually going to be one oxygen. Um, eights and eights are going to have the same charge, but in the eight is missing an oxygen, basically. So nitrate is NO3 with a negative charge. Nitrite is NO2 with a negative charge. Phosphate is PO4 negative, negative three. Phosphite is PO3 with a negative three. So they're somewhat predictable in that way. If you have the eights memorized, then the eight is just gonna be the same formula missing an oxygen, right? And so sulfate sulfite versus sulfite, chlorate versus chlorite, um, they're not on here, but bromates versus bromites. Um, that's, that's always going to be the common thread with all of these that are, uh, if you have an eight versus an eight. And we can go one further if we look at specifically at the, so nitrate versus nitrates are similar, same formula, just missing an oxygen, chlorate and chlorite. And if you extend that, if you're missing two oxygens relative to the eight, then we say it's hypo. So hypoite, so hypochlorite is chlorate that's missing two oxygens. And perchlorate is chlorate that's got an extra oxygen. So there's all these sort of modifier terms that are basically taking the eight and adjusting it. So if you know all of the, the names that end in eight and you know a few of these rules that kind of cuts down on your, your, memor your raw memorization. And what about ID? So the IDs tend to be the ones that are have been around the longest. We've known about them the longest. If it's if it ends in ID, IDE, and it's on the periodic table, that generally means that it's just that atom with a negative charge. So chlorine turns to chloride when it's just Cl minus. Um, but there are a couple of polyatomic ions that are also that also end in ide, and they're they're the ones that tend to be very common, or we, as a, as a species, we've known about them for a very long time. So hydroxide hydroxide ends in ide, and it's basically ox, oxid 
sorry, it's basically an oxide with a hydrogen attached, hence the name. So a hydroxide is just OH with a negative one charge. Um, the only other one I think on here is cyanide. Uh, and cyanide is that um, CN with a negative one charge. And that's just, we've known about cyanide as a compound for a very long time. So it got named before some of these other eights, eight eight rules were common. Um, eights and eights are pretty much always going to be oxygens involved, though. It's basically going to give you sort of a name, and then it's going to have the eight is going to have some number of oxygens with it. So it's not on here, but bromate is a compound, and we could assume that bromate is going to be a bromine with some number of oxygens around it and a charge. Right, so if you know some some basics, you can kind of extrapolate a little bit. Um, but the only ones I'm going to really test you on are the ones on this table here. Isn't there a bromide also? There's, and so remember, anything that ends in just IDE, that's our simplest one. That's not even a polyatomic ion. Okay. All so right. IDE, let me get my periodic table pulled up here. Uh, um, anything that's the ends in IDE where the base is just on the periodic table, that's just that compound with a negative charge. Or sorry, that element with a negative charge. <clears throat> so bromide within, with IDE is bromine with a negative one charge. Bromate or bromite are going to have some oxygens involved, and those are going to be polyatomics. So the IDE is always the simplest forms of whatever you're dealing with. And the polyatomics are going to be the ones that end in an eight or an ite, depending on the situation. All right. And again, I'm sorry to say I don't have a better way of learning these than memorizing. I was. I was taught these by memorizing them and you know, eventually got to the point where they became second nature. Um, there's not a more systematic way to go about it that I'm aware of. Um, so this, I was just circling all the eights and eights and showing you that they're, they're all just missing one oxygen just for the to um, sort of cement that. And again, if you go through and memorize the ones that end in eight, that's going to be 90% of the compounds you actually see in the real world. 90% of the polyatomics you actually see in the real world end in eight because they tend to be the most stable. Um, things like pickling salt are going to have different, I think that pickling salt has nitrites in it um, as part of what makes it preserve um, food better is because the nitrites are slight, are are um, likely to denature any foreign proteins that get in there. Any living cells are going to have a hard time living in there. Um, and sulfites show up naturally in some fermented products. I think sulfites show up naturally in red wine. Um, but for the most part, the, your eights are going to be the most common ones that you see in everyday life. Um, and since this, this class is going to be open book and, um, for the test, this is just one of those things that along with your periodic table and your sheet of conversions, I would have this list printed out and just have it handy. And I have a bunch of, of resources, um, you know, digital flip card or uh, flashcards you can test on Quizlet um, with these. And I think the link is on uh, either last week's or this week's um, resources page. Um, to sort of just get yourself comfortable with these um, because um, it will behoove you to be quick, at least with the most common of these, nitrates, carbonates, sulfates are the most common that you see all over the place. Um, so those would be good ones to have, have memorized. And then the other trick with these is to make sure you don't mess up the charge because if you mess up the charge, that's gonna mess up the whole formula, right? Because you need to get the right charge in order to get the right number of each ion. So just make sure you're double checking that as well.
right? So there, here's just a table of those common names. Sulfate versus per sulfate would be within one extra oxygen. Sulfite would be missing one oxygen compared to the eight. Hyposulfite would be missing two oxygens compared to the eight. And if you have something that says hydrogen sulfate, that just means you have an extra hydrogen attached, but it's not just, it's generally a hydrogen with a positive charge. So your overall charge differs by one. So this last one, hydrogen sulfate, we took sulfate and we added, we added an H plus to it. So it's still SO4, but the charge is off by one because we added an H plus. Yes, yeah, part six of the homework. Can we explain two and six? Yeah, let's pull that homework up. Okay, M MGS and CUBR. So, <clears throat> so these are these are what are known as binary compounds because their binary means two and they are only have two elements present. Um, so for both of these, we would want to, to say the name for both of these, we want to say the name of each ion. So for the first one, for magnesium, um, magnesium, when it's an ion, is always plus two, right? Because it's in the second column of the periodic table. And so we don't need to specify the charge on a magnesium ion because magnesium ion is always plus two, no matter what. So for the name for MGS, we would just name it magnesium sulfide because magnesium sulfide is always the same two charges. It's always plus two and a negative two. You only need to use the Roman numerals when you've got more than one possible charge on your metal. So those are going to be the D block. So the D block and the F block, with the exception of those, those weird ones where, that actually behave normally. Those five that behave normally, we don't actually need to say a charge on them. But if it's to the right of column two, and it's not one of these five that I circled, then you always give it the Roman numeral. So copper um, can have a plus one or a plus two charge. Therefore, when we say the name of this compound, we want to say specifically that, the, that it's got a plus one charge to it. So we name it copper one bromide. Right. So that's the whole purpose of those Roman numerals is if there's any ambiguity as to what the charge could be, we just specify the charge. And when we talk about individual ions as well, we'll just use the, the say the charge as well. If we want to talk about iron three ions. So um, with magnesium sulfide, mm -hmm. it you can question whether it's two or like I thought it's from where that is on the periodic table. Doesn't it need two? It needs to lose two electrons exactly. So why why is that magnesium two sulfide? So we wouldn't say the two because if magnesium has a charge, it's always going to be plus two. Okay. So is there a possibility that maybe then your key was wrong on some of these? Because I feel like maybe it, maybe I looked at it wrong, but I thought it said two. Let so that's me, where I was getting questioning on some of these, I think. Okay. Yeah, that, that's certainly possible. Um, let me double check that. I'll look at the key real quick. Um, and that's certainly something that does happen. I tend to okay. be in a hurry when I write these. Um, so maybe I that's where I was confusing keys. myself then because some of your key might have been wrong, but. Um, Is it section six? Yeah. Yeah, you have a two there. Oh, and that's okay. That's because it's not magnesium. Oh, whoops, it's in. Hello, sorry. No worries. Can you explain that? Um, so manganese is on our periodic table in the D block. It's right next to iron. So we do need to specify the charge on it because manganese can actually have 
I think up to a plus seven charge. It can be plus two plus or anything from plus two to plus seven. So we just always want to specify the charge on a manganese. So we would name it manganese two sulfide. So maybe I'm confused then where, where does it happen when the Roman numeral is like specifying, like you talked about right off the bat with like, uh, I think it was like, uh, Maybe it was nitrate, but there was three of them. Yeah, so am I getting something confused there? Yeah, so prob probably where you're you're getting a little hung up is that the three is referring just to the charge, not to how many of the other ion there is. Okay, okay, okay. All right, perfect. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, that's that is a really common thing to get hung up on. Um, the three is referring, if you say the name vanadium three nitrate, the three is referring to the charge on the vanadium, not how many nitrates you have. Okay. And let me double check the copper bromide, make sure that I didn't. Yeah. So six, I think that one's also right. It's copper one bromide because that one is referring to the charge on the right. copper. I yeah. think I just had it mixed up for sure. Thank you. No problem. And always, I, I want all of you to feel comfortable um, if you think you find a typo. Um, if you're going through the key on the homeworks and you don't understand something, either um, either you, you need some help with it, you can ask me for help and I can clarify it, or um, there's a typo on the key. And either way, I'd like you to let me know so that we can either get you feeling better about it and so you understand what's going on or I can fix the key. So um, always feel free. I won't be offended if you, uh, if you find errors in my keys. Um, I like to know about them. <laughs> um, and then a couple of last questions about Vesper a little bit. Um, somebody asked, why the heck do we care about these molecular shapes? Like it's cool that we can predict these shapes and geometrically what's going on with these, these molecular geometries, um, but why, do, why does it matter? Well, a huge, one huge place where it matters is actually in understanding how medications work. Um, there are a lot of different fields um, where, the, where the geometries wind up having an impact, for instance, you know, metallurgy or material science, understanding the molecular, the molecular orbital shapes um, is going to be very critical to doing things like designing photovoltaic solar cells. But on the, on the other hand, just understanding how medication works, it's all based around the molecular geometries. Medications work in general because they're interfering with some natural process in your body. Um, and they do that by having a similar shape to existing naturally occurring compounds in your body um, and basically interfering with the processes that either break down those natural molecules or the processes that produce them. Um, and that can have a wide variety of impacts on your body. You can wind up increasing concentrations of certain molecules in your body. Uh, you can wind up speeding up the process of getting rid of those molecules. And those can have effects on things like your mood, your emotions, um, all the way down to sending pain signals from in your nervous system is based around these three-dimensional shapes of these molecules. Um, on? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> is that then how that molecule fits into the receptor? Exactly. Exactly. So if we look at, let me see if there's a good, uh, so this is what's known as the most, the simplest form of this is what's known as competitive inhibition, um, which is basically, um, if you have, if you have two enzymes, wow, that's pixelated. That works. Good old Khan Academy. Um, if you have a process in your body that normally takes a molecule called a substrate and it fits into the active site and it breaks it apart and makes different products. Well, if you have another molecule in your body that can occupy that same active site, it's gonna slow down the process of breaking apart that other molecule because you're basically taking up space. 
um, that the that the substrate needs, and that's all the all based around these molecular geometries. Because if it binds too well, if your competitive inhibitor binds too well to that site, you actually wind up ruining that entire enzyme, and it doesn't work anymore. And that winds up usually being a bad thing. But if it doesn't bind well enough, then there's no effect. And so these these different molecular shapes are what give us the difference between say dopamine and serotonin in our body and why um, certain, certain drugs that affect serotonin levels can have an effect on depression. It's all based around the shapes of those molecules and the shapes of these active sites. Um, so it's, it's on its own is knowing what the, what the Vesper geometry of carbon dioxide is gonna do. Is that gonna really make a difference to you as a, as a medical practitioner? No but we're laying the groundwork for understanding how um, things like Tylenol work, understanding how aspirin works, understanding how chemotherapy works, because a lot of it is based around these molecular geometries. Um, it's the difference between say Adderall and meth is just molecular wow. shape. It's one extra carbon shaped in the tetrahedral shape, put it in the right spot and you get, and you take, amphetamine and turn it to methamphetamine right same so it went, go ahead same with like xenoestrogens in the atmosphere in our environment come yeah, in lot, lots of, of uh, sex hormones like estrogens and testosterone that wind up um all of the the way that they interact with different enzymes in some species versus other species winds up having an effect on whether or not we should be worried about them um, and so it, it does, it's sort of a, this is a tricky class because it's, it seems like we're going to cover a bunch of stuff. None of it's all that relevant yet, but we're laying groundwork for biochemistry and organic chemistry um, down the road in environmental science classes as well. I mentioned CO2 um, and knowing the molecular geometry of CO2 actually is really vital for, for being able to show that it's a greenhouse gas. Um, knowing that CO2 and methane are greenhouse gases is really important for environmental science and, and dealing with climate change, right? Um, so not, you know, so there's, um, there's absolutely lots of crossover. It just doesn't feel like it yet because we're still at such the small molecule stage. As we get able to apply these ideas to larger molecules, we'll see it more obvious applications in terms of uh, healthcare, especially. And one, just one more of these questions that if, if you have not heard of chirality before, um, chirality is the, is the, uh, um, concept that you can have two mirror images that are not duplicate of the same of the same um, object. So, for instance, if you took um, if you ignore the writing, I have a chapstick here. If I took a mirror image of a chap chapstick tube, it's it's still a chapstick tube, right? Um, but there are certain classes of molecules we refer to as being chiral, where if you take the mirror image of them, it's not the same object anymore. So for instance, your right hand versus your left hand. If you take a mirror image of your right hand, you get your left hand, but your left hand is not the same as your right hand. It's got the same general shape. Your fingers are kind of ordered the same way, but you can't take your right hand and put it into a left-handed glove, right? That would that just wouldn't work, right? You, it would not fit properly because even though your hands are mirror images of each other. So this comes from, and the reason that this is relevant is because this we see this in molecules. Um, if we have two molecules that are, it doesn't matter what this, these atoms are, this is just for the sake of demonstrating, um, if that are mirror images of each other, both of these atoms are tetrahedral, um, but if you take the mirror image, if you have a carbon that's attached to four distinct objects, then when you take the mirror image of it, it's not the same molecule. There's no way I can take this molecule on the left and spin it around so that it looks like the molecule on the right. If I take this and try and put that purple atom over on the side, 
it looks now it looks very close to the same molecule, except that this one has the um, oxygen going back and the hydrogen coming forward versus flipped. There's no way we could then spin this around to try and make it look like the same molecule. If I put the oxygen and the hydrogen in the right spot, I've got my purple atom and my green atom are switched. So we actually wind up with two separate molecules that have all of the same bonds and have the exact same formula, um, but are just arranged in space differently, which is, seems really weird. Seems like that shouldn't be possible because it seems like well, you've got the same bonds. Why isn't the same, it the same molecule? Um, and so that's what's known as chirality or chiral molecules are molecules that have um, where their mirror image is not the same molecule. Um, and it basically, it comes down to the math and the fact that we live in a three-dimensional universe or the fact we, we perceive it to be a three-dimensional universe. Um, you can't go from one of those molecules to the other without breaking something off and then reattaching it. Um, and so that, Anytime you've got four distinct atoms attached to the middle to a middle carbon in three dimensional space, you're going to wind up with that sort of situation. Um, and it's so it's not anything you need to worry about right now. But somebody asked about chirality, and this is another reason why Vesper geometries matter. And this is getting even more specific. Um, but there's there was a huge uh, problem in the, I want to say it was the 60s, it might have been late 50s, early 60s, um, with, a, with a drug called thalidomide that has two different isomers, two different um, chiral versions, um, one of which was really effective as an anti-nausea drug. Um, they prescribed it to um, women with morning sickness in Europe. Um, However, what they didn't know is that the, the mirror image of that drug, that they were making at the same time, they didn't, at the time, they didn't think that there was a difference in how the body would process these two drugs. Um, the mirror image of that molecule um, caused a huge amount of errors and basically stunted growth in any tissue that was rapidly growing, um, which you might imagine caused lots of problems in pregnant mothers. Um, that were trying to grow fetuses, um, being exposed to this drug that's, that prevented tissue growth, basically meant that a lot of, of children that were born in the 60s um, in Europe, where this drug was commonly prescribed, had horrendous birth defects, like missing arms. Um, and it was because they didn't know the difference between these two versions, these two mirror images, one of which was a good anti-nausea drug and the other stops tissue growth. Um, despite everything else being the, sim the same, the different shape between the two meant it fit into very different receptor sites in the enzymes and stopped very different processes. Um, and luckily in the US, we, um, this was, it was never prescribed um, because of the FDA. Um, there was a woman at the FDA, I don't know if she was the director, if she was just one of the working scientists who basically um, refused to let thalidomide be approved um, because she felt there was not enough research done on it and, and that the different, she specifically called out the chirality um, as being important and that we didn't know enough about the different versions of this drug. Um, so this, it was never commonly prescribed in the U.S., and we didn't have this issue in the U.S. as a result of that, which is why the FDA is so important, um, because it seemed like a really good drug on paper uh, until it wasn't. All right. Um, the next few slides are basically going through the process of naming covalent compounds, which I think you guys got a fair bit of practice with, um, just using these prefixes. Um, and again, if it's a covalent compound, that means that it's it doesn't have a charge and it's all non-metals. And you're just going to name it using these prefixes. Um, because there are multiple ways you can combine nitrogen and oxygen, um, we need to be specific as to how many of each of them we have. 
you can't just say nitrogen oxide because you can have nitrogen dioxide or nitrogen trioxide or nitrogen monoxide or dinitrogen pentoxide, right? So all of those are neutral molecules. They're all combining these atoms in different ways uh, and they're all distinct from each other. So that's why we use these prefixes in covalent compounds, but not in ionic compounds, because in ionic compounds, the charges dictate how many we have of everything. But in covalent compounds, we don't always know that ratio. So we specify. Um, and I also just want to be clear as well, um, the old school way of naming some of the ionic compounds and some of the covalent compounds um, would be to say something like instead of NO2, um, say nitric oxide. And the ick suffix on the nitric was telling you how what the formal charge is what it's called, the oxidation state on the nitrogen is. It's less explicit and less universal. Um, so we we switched away from using that. So we should not name anything as nitrous oxide versus nitric oxide. We're not, we don't use that system anymore. And same with a lot of the transition metals. Before it was common to use, say iron three versus iron two, you would say ferric versus ferrous, a ferric nitrate versus ferrous nitrate. And the suffix indicated what the charge was, but again, was far less universal and far and relied far more on memorizing. Well, what are the possible charges of iron versus copper versus manganese? So we don't use those systems anymore. So if you just Google some of these compounds on these nomenclature problems, you're going to get the wrong answer because I don't want to see ferric nitrate or ferric oxide. I want to see iron three oxide because that's the system that's in use today that's more useful and more powerful and more explicit. Right. So I think if you just typed in VNO33, you got vanadyl nitrate with a YL suffix on the vanadium. Um, that tells me that you just Googled it because we didn't go over that at all. It's not the system that's commonly in use. So I want you to be using those Roman numerals or these prefixes as appropriate, not using the old school naming systems. All right, we've talked about these. So let's take our break. Let's come back at 2.35 and we'll go over writing these out and naming them just for more practice. The more times I can get you to drill this in your head through sheer repetition, the less likely you are to mess up um, your uh, polyatomic ions. All right, so 10 minutes, 2.35 and we'll go over this.
All right. I think I fixed my video or my uh, audio issue. I think everything should be back the way it was. Or normal, anyway. Hopefully, you are hearing this. Yeah. Looks like it's picking up anyway. All right, so let's bring it back and let's start working on on these just to practice it one more time. So the formula for these is going to wind up being the same as same process as as any of our other ionic compounds. Right? How many of each ion do you need to make it add up to a charge of zero? Um, so for magnesium and sulfate, they've got a plus two and a minus two, so we just need one of each. Our formula would be MgSO4. Our name would just be magnesium sulfate. Same, and we're still going to get the same one-to-one -one ratio for sodium and nitrate. And again, for right now, you guys probably are needing to check these formulas on your list of polyatomics. But some of the most common ones, you're just going to start getting down pretty quickly. Just um, make sure that you're, uh, when you're practicing these, that you're getting the right charge on them. So NO3 is nitrates. Uh, Na1 plus is sodium. So we need our formula would be NO, Na, NO, Three, and our name would just be sodium nitrate. No Roman numerals needed for these ones, right? Because sodium and magnesium are in those first two columns on the periodic table. If we want to look at this example here with lead two ion, if we have lead two and we have acetate, which is the C C2H3O2, is an organic ion called acetate, we need two acetates for every one lead. So our formula would just be Pb C2H3O2 parentheses two. Two acetates for every one lead. And our name would just be lead to acetate. And last but not least, our formula here be three to one, so Al, ClO3, three, and our name for that would just be aluminum chlorate. No Roman numerals needed on this one, right? Because aluminum is one of those five exceptions. Aluminum doesn't have a d orbital, right? So, or not, doesn't have a full, any electrons in a d orbital. So it doesn't behave weirdly. So aluminum only has three valence electrons. It can lose all three of them to become plus three. So we don't need to specify a charge on aluminum. All right, going the other direction, again, is going to require a little bit of memorizing. Let me see if I can separate this out a little bit more so I can see what's happening a little bit better. Potassium and phosphate and ammonium and chloride. So if you know that what the formula and the charge for phosphate 
is this isn't so this isn't so bad, right? Potassium has got to be is going to be a plus one, and phosphate is PO four three minus. So we need three potassiums for every one phosphate. So K three. PO4. Ammonium chloride is one of those, is that uh, exception. Ammonium is our only common positively charged polyatomic. So it's still an ionic compound, but it's not going to have a metal in it. So our formula here, a chloride is negative one. And ammonium is NH four uh, plus one. So we only need one of each. So formula for ammonium chloride is just going to be NH four Cl. Um, and this also brings me up to somebody, somebody asked a question um, about NH3 and the, the name for that, the covalent name for that. Um, because I believe on the homework assignment, it's written NH3, but the name that was given was trihydrogen nitride. Um, so they switched the order. Generally speaking, the, the rule for when we're naming or when we're writing these formulas is you put whatever is positive first and then you follow it with whatever is negative and in a covalent compound you write whatever has the is the most electronegative last An electron most electronegative is most likely to pull electrons towards itself so basically the closer you are to fluorine in the top right the more likely that's going to be what goes last in your formula so that's why we write H2O, is that the hydrogens are not as electronegative as the oxygen. So we say the oxygen second. Ammonia is NH3, and it's sort of an exception. It's a common molecule. We, nobody ever calls it trihydrogen nitride. It's just ammonia. Um, and so it, it gets written as NH3, but really the nitrogen is closer to that top right corner. So the nitrogen should be written second. It should be H3N technically, and then the name that would go along with that would be um, trihydrogen nitride if we're using the our official covalent names. It would be trihydrogen nitride. It's just, for whatever reason, the nitrogen in ammonia specifically, um, and it, it never really occurred to me until this person asked that question, um, that in ammonia, we always write the nitrogen first for some reason, and I don't even know why. Um, so don't let that one throw you off if you thought you were understanding things and that the key made that one seem wrong. Um, it's just a weird thing about historically how you would write ammonia was NH3, not H3N. H3N would be the correct way to write it technically. It's just not how it's done. And I'm going to have to think more about why that is in the future and make sure I point that out to not confuse people. <clears throat> um, hydrogen cyanide. Well, cyanide was on our, on our polyatomics. It was CN with a negative charge. And when hydrogen has a positive charge, it's plus one. So hydrogen cyanide, just HCN, one of each. Calcium carbonate, Ca2 plus, and carbonate is CO3 two minus, 
So our formula here would just be CA CO three. Interestingly enough, it's not that interesting. Everything has to have a formula, right? Um, calcium carbonate is limestone, um, chalk. Also a main component of that, of uh, lime scale that you see on your, you get on your um, shower head, if you have, if you have hard water especially, um, is basically the calcium ions that are dissolved in your water reacting with the CO2 in the air when it comes out of the shower head and they turn into the solid compound called cal calcium carbonate. All right. So I think between last week's homework and the key and this primer on using polyatomic ions, I feel I feel like we've spent a fair bit of time on ionic nomenclature and polyatomics. Um, hopefully you're feeling fairly confident with these as well as at least as long as you have your cheat sheet. Um, any questions on this before we move on? Make sure I'm checking. And if you can manage to do it without looking at your at your cheat sheet, so much the better. Just make sure you're checking yourself while you're still getting the hang of things because you don't want to practice it wrong and cement it in your head the wrong way. Um, because as, as my colleague Carl likes to say, practice makes permanent. Not practice makes perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you're practicing it wrong, you're going to really set yourself up to have problems in the future, right? Um, for covalent compounds, once you get these, as long, as long as you can recognize that it's a covalent compound, most of these prefixes are pretty straightforward. Tetra is the only one that's not probably something that you've seen before. Um, and it's because it comes from the Greek rather than the Latin. I don't know why they didn't use quattro or quad, quad in some form, but they use tetra instead. Um, but tetra still means four in Greek, I believe, at least in ancient Greek. Um, and I always remembered it because it's like Tetris. I grew up playing Tetris and every one of the blocks in Tetris that you can get is made out of four smaller blocks. Um, and I was always taught that getting, getting uh, one of those long skinny ones and clearing four rows at the same time was called getting a Tetris um, because there was four rows at the same time. So Tetra comes from that root of four still. And now that I've said it enough times in a row, hopefully you guys will remember that as well. Um, so water would just be dihydrogen monoxide. CO would just be carbon monoxide. We don't say monocarbon monoxide. If, if it's the first element that you write, if it's the less electronegative element, um, we always assume you have one of those unless otherwise specified. So you don't say monocarbon monoxide, it's just carbon monoxide because you assume that the first one is always a one. Um, and that's usually the case. Things like dinitrogen trioxide are fairly rare. Usually, whatever you have one of, for instance, sulfur dioxide, SO2. You can also have disulfur tetraoxide, which would be S2O4. So you only specify that first element if it's not a one. And I already touched on this uh, a little bit, but this is just a good way to, it's, it's not a perfect way, it's still a little confusing to look at, but just a reminder that it's a series of yes, no questions. Is it ionic or covalent? And that tells you which path to go down. If it's covalent, you just say the name of each non-metals and you use the prefix to say how many you have. If it's ionic, you say the name of each ion you might need to get more specific if it's a transition metal, right? So knowing which system to use is the trickiest part of this, and then knowing that the polyatomic ions exist. Um, let's save the molecular geometry practice for Wednesday so we can get into, oh no, it's going on its own. Um, so what happens when I animate my slides. Um, 
let's start talking about chemical reactions. So chemical reactions happen now that we have a way of describing compounds as being ionic or covalent and what their shapes look like. We can do things like turn grams into number of moles. All of that is useful in a lot of ways because um, we can write changes that are happening as chemical reactions. Right, and these chemical reactions are basically um, ways of describing how you can change from one state to another. So a law of conservation of mass says you can't destroy or create matter. We can just change its form. So these chemical reactions are just a way of, of writing down how something can change form. Um, and so the most important, the, the thing that tells you you're dealing with a reaction is generally this reaction arrow in the middle. So you're always going to write it as reactants and then turning into products. Right? So that reaction arrow is really just signifying that something is changing. And what's left of the arrow is telling you what you're starting with, and what's right of the arrow is telling you what you're ending with. Right? Pretty straightforward. That's kind of the way we would think about using an arrow normally anyway. It's pointing out a change. Um, and the terms that we use here is reactants are the compounds that are doing the reacting. And the products are what you produce. Products are what you make. Right? So none of this is probably new vocabulary to you other than this word reactant. Uh, and occasionally um, still gets written as um, reagent is the, uh, is the old school way of saying reactant. A reagent um, means the exact same thing. Um, I don't even, frankly, they're so much the exact same thing that I don't even know why we have two words for it. Scientifically speaking, we should only have one word for reactants, and reactants is a good word. Um, so if you see reagent, just autocorrect it in your head to reactant. It means the same thing. Um, there is some more information that's included in here as well, uh, and that's that we generally want to write the phase of all of the reactants and products as well, because there are some reactions that will only occur if a molecule is in the gas phase. Um, and it will, turns out it dramatically affects things like um, how fast a reaction happens, how, how much product you can make is dependent on the phase of your reactants. So we were frequently, if we're writing out a complete chemical reaction, you always want to say what the phase is of everything. Um, so G would be for gas. You'd have solid liquid gas, just, and we just signify that with SL or G. And then the last one is if we're, uh, we will frequently see reactions happening in water in a solution where everything is dissolved in water and everything's floating around in water. And so to describe that situation, we have a, a fourth, it's not really a separate phase, it's just saying that you have a mixture. Um, and we just say AQ for aqueous, which just means in water. The other aspect of these reactions is that I mentioned before that we can't make or destroy atoms. We have to have the same number of atoms before and after, which means we can't start with four carbon atoms and end up with only one carbon atom. In order for this to work, um, you need to, you basically, it's, it's a lot like, like balancing a checkbook or which I guess that's a bad example. Um, since nobody balances checkbooks anymore. But it's just, it's basically making sure that what you end with is the same as what you started with. You have to have the same number and types of atoms on both sides of the reaction. So, and we call this process balancing the reaction. Balancing a reaction is just the process of taking what you start with and what you end with and making sure you have the same number of each type of atom. Um, and we can't do that ju by just um, by just plugging in a, 
a four in the subscript. We have carbon dioxide here. If we just went in there and said, okay, well, I'm just gonna take this and I need four carbons to be used. So I'm just gonna put a four there. You can't do that because that's no longer the same compound. It's not carbon dioxide anymore. It's tetracarbon dioxide that doesn't really exist. Right, so you, we're not going to do this. Once you have the compounds written down, we can't do it by changing the formulas. All we can do is change how many of each molecule you have, not what molecule it is. Right, C4H10 is butane. If you changed that to something else, it would no longer be butane, and you'd be talking about a different reaction. Right, so that's against the rules. Once you have your compounds written, you balance it by talking about how many molecules do you have in each of, um, in order to make it balance. So you can't just put a, a four here on, after the second carbon, but we can say, okay, well, I'm making CO2. And if I start with four carbons, I must be making four CO2s. Because now I have four carbons on the left-hand side and I have four carbons on the right-hand side. And we could do the same thing with our hydrogens too, right? We have 10 hydrogens on the left and I'm making, turning all my hydrogens into water. So if I have 10 hydrogens on the left, I must be making five water molecules. Because every water molecule has two hydrogens. So if I have five water molecules, that's a total of 10 hydrogen atoms. So now, our carbons are balanced, our hydrogens are balanced, we just need to balance oxygen. And usually the best way to approach these, so this would be assuming we started with one butane molecule. Usually the best way to, to do these is to, whatever you have that you can change, it's all by itself, like oxygen, we can change the number of oxygen atoms without changing anything else. So we're gonna save oxygen for last, balance everything else, and then see how many oxygens we need. Uh, in this case, we made, we have eight oxygens in the form of CO2, and we have five oxygens in the form of <clears throat> water. So we need to add enough O2 molecules so that we can get a total of 13 oxygens on the on the right hand side, we need 13 oxygens on the left hand side as well. All right, so really, this is just a, a matter of um, not quite guess and check, but basically making just making sure that some that you're you have the same number of each atom on both sides. And you're doing that by adding whole numbers of molecules. Now, if we have O2, can we use a whole number in front of the O2 to get to a total of 13 oxygen atoms? We have to be counting by twos, right? So that just tells us that we needed to go back and, and if that's ever the case, you're just gonna go back and double everything that you already did. And now all of a sudden it's not eight oxygens there, it's 16 oxygens. And it's not 10 there, it's, or sorry, it's not five oxygens, it's 10. So now we need 26 oxygens, which we can get to, right? Counting by twos, we put a 13 here in front of the O2. So sometimes it can take a little erasing. It can take a little bit of guess and check. We basically just start plugging in numbers until everything balances. And usually if you, if you go systematically, it's, you're going to wind up with either everything balances out or you're going to need to go through and double everything and try again. All right, so if it's balanced, and so those, those numbers that we put in front of the compounds are called coefficients. It's basically the number of each molecule we need. 
to make the overall reaction balanced. When we do that, get it right. This is one of those things that that everybody should be able to, you might not always be able to balance something. You might be missing something or just some get stuck on a test, but you should always know whether you got it right or not, because all it is is adding things up. If it's balanced, all of your atoms should wind up being the same on both sides. Right? You can also think of this reaction arrow like an equal sign. Whatever you have on the left has to be the same as what you have on the right. All right, so here's a list of, of practice reactions that you can balance. And again, some of them are going to be going to feel a little bit like guess and check, and some of them are going to be really, really straightforward. but there is definitely a way to balance everything on here. So let's give these a try. I'll come through and fill them out in a, in a minute. And before I start working through these, I should say that I don't know why this problem is structured the way it is, but A is the hardest one. So if A is giving you trouble, skip it for a second. Get work up to build up your confidence on um, some of the others and then come back to A. All right, so I'm going to start at the top. So there are a couple ways you could approach this. This in particular is a tricky one because you have chlorine in two different products. But if you start from the perspective of looking at the phosphorus, your phosphorus is already balanced. There's one phosphorus on both sides right? And same with your oxygen. Your oxygen, there's one oxygen on the left and one oxygen on the right. If we have one water, we have to be making at least two HCLs, right? Because we, if we can't have less than one water molecule, and every one water molecule is going to make two HCLs. And that all of a sudden, just doing that kind of clears it up, actually, right? Because 
I mean, it's still not all that. Obvious. Our phosphorus is still balanced. Our oxygen is still balanced. By putting a two in front of the HCl, we balanced our hydrogens. And at the same time, we balanced our chlorines. So we had five chlorines on the left, and now we have five chlorines on the right. So because you wind up making a product that has chlorines and or products where you have a um, more than a chlorine in more than one product, it seems like it's trickier, and it is a little trickier. But if you just ignore the chlorines and get everything else balanced, a lot of times the chlorines will take care of themselves, or whatever that that particular problematic element is in any given reaction. All right, so it's it's sort of it's a not sort of it is a logic puzzle where the whole idea is going to be um, there are certain constraints based on what you start with and what you're making. So you if you know that there are some constraints, you can use that to your advantage. So I believe that that A is our, is balanced just by putting a two in front of HCl. Does the equation have to be in like the simplest form for it to be correct? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does make sense. Um, it's better to have it balanced, but not in its simplest form than unbalanced, right? So it's way more wrong to have it be not balanced, but it's best to have it in its, mo in its simplest form, its most reduced form. So if you ever balance something and you wind up with all even numbers, for instance, then it would still be balanced if you divided everything by two, right? Because it's just like an, an equal sign, like I said, right? So if you if it's balanced, anything you do to the left-hand side, you can do to the right-hand side. And that includes dividing your coefficients by the same number. So if you balanced it and you came up with two, 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 and four, that's not, wrong it's just not as right as it could be it would be better if it was one 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 two and this is why i give partial credit right because there are degrees of wrongness all right for the second one this is another one that's a little bit weird because you have nitrogen showing up in more than one place but you know at the very least you have a total of three nitrogens on the right-hand side, right? Two is for, as nitrate and um, one nitrogen is nitrogen monoxide. So that means at the very least, you, you know you need to have at least a three there. This is one of those where starting by what you know, you, it's got, it ha can't be a one and it can't be a two. So if we start with a three and see what that does to everything else, if that helped things or not, that now we have three hydrogens on the left and the only place hydrogen shows up on the right is, that, is as water, right? So that changes things because we can't have an odd number of hydrogens now. So, if it can't be one, it can't be two, it can't be three, we could try four. And if we have a four there, that means we've got four hydrogens on the left, which means we could make two waters. And we can't put a two in front of the copper nitrate, copper two nitrate, because that would be adding two more nitrogens. And we only added one more nitrogen, right? But we could do a two here. And our coppers are balanced because we started with one copper on each side and we never changed it. Our hydrogens are balanced because we have four hydrogens as HNO3 and we have four hydrogens in water. Our nitrogens are balanced because we have four nitrogens on the left and four nitrogens on the right. <clears throat> Excuse me. What did that do to our oxygens though? Now we have 
12 oxygens on the left and six, seven, eight, nine, ten on the right. We're still not quite there. So what else could we do? Well, if you don't see other options, just put a five there and go from there and see what that does. See what that changes about our logic puzzle. No, we can't have a five there, can we? Because we need an even number of hydrogens. So that now says three waters. We've got a total of, of six nitrogens. So that would be putting a four here. So now our hydrogens are balanced, our nitrogens are balanced, coppers are still balanced. And we've got a total of three times six. So 18 oxygens on the left, and we've got six plus three plus four. That's, I guess, closer to getting balanced, 18 versus 13. All right, so you see how we go start, just start being strategic about it. Let's try eight. Now it's making four waters and six NO. Now we've got 24 oxygens on the left and Six, four, six. So still not there. So this is one of the problems, and again, they the, this practice problem, I always forget this when I look at this slide, um, gives you two really hard ones and then follows it up with two much easier ones. So bear that in mind, C and D are much easier. But if it was 10, five and eight, We're starting to get into, so that gives us a total of 30 over here and five and eight. You know, I'm remembering this from last year. There's something missing on this one. Um, this has a typo in it. So once you get to 10 on one of yours, if you still, if it seems to be getting further away as you're getting systematic about it, that will tell you that you did something, that there's something wrong with the equation, right? Because we've tried literally every option up to 10, right? And we're getting further away from having our oxygens balanced, right? So it's a logic puzzle and sometimes logic puzzles don't give you enough information. So I'm going to double check this one. And I guess I can I can let you watch the process of double checking this, which is just writing it, it into Google and seeing what the balanced. Uh, it says the reaction of copper, metal, and nitric acid.
Um, this is actually a very fun reaction to do. There we go. Oh, we just didn't take it far enough. But it is also producing nitrous acid. This is the one we were missing as well. So this is a bad example. And this textbook should not have given you this example. Um, so ignore that one. Process we used to figure out that the textbook was wrong still holds. Be systematic about it and just keep trying options. Um, but that one in particular, need to, you need more information for. <clears throat> All right, so let's do easier ones. Let's do ones that work. C, H2 plus I2. Well, if you have H2 as one of your molecules, you know you have to be making at least two of these molecules, right? And if you do that, H2 to two H's here. Hydrogens are balanced, and that took care of the iodine as well. Because you also have two iodines on the left, and now you have two iodines on the right. Right, so simply by putting the two in front of HI, you balanced it. So iron and oxygen. So this is iron metal reacting with oxygen gas. This is iron rusting. If it reacts, if iron reacts with oxygen to make iron three oxide, well, we know we can't make an odd number of oxygens from oxygen gas, right? So that means we know right off the bat, there has to be a two here. because we're limited to only having even numbers of oxygens. So we need to make sure we have an even number of oxygens on both sides. Easiest way to make sure you have an even number of oxygens is to double whatever you have. If you're starting with an odd number of oxygens, you just double it, and now it's even number. So that gives us six oxygens on the product side, which means we would need three O2 molecules. Now our oxygens are good. And the only thing left to do is add however many um, irons we need. We have a total of four irons on the product side, which means you need four irons on the reactant side. All right, so most of these are not nearly as scary as B. And most of them will be solvable. There's always a possibility if I try to get cute writing questions that I give you something that's not solvable. Um, I try to not do that, but it does occasion uh, happen on occasion, especially if I trust that somebody else's proofreading is good enough that, that uh, it doesn't have errors in it. I know, my, I know my stuff needs to be proofread before I give it to you, but I, sometimes I trust textbooks to not do that, and textbooks are not always the best at that. Um, all right, I know we won't get into talking about types of reactions today. Um, so with the two minutes I have remaining, just a note about how textbooks work in general while we're on the subject of not trusting textbook answers. Um, textbooks are written by professors usually, and they're usually proofread by grad students that are not being paid nearly enough for the level of monotonous work that they're doing. Um, they're being asked to work 60 hours a week for less than minimum wage. Um, writing out the solution keys to your, your science textbooks. Um, and with that in mind, the professor does not always go back through and make sure that their grad students did it right. It's just something that they need to do for the publisher, basically. Um, so don't trust the answer keys uh, implicitly. Answer keys can be wrong. Problems can just be written wrong, even if they're in a textbook. Just don't assume just because it's printed. Um, that it's right. So with that little nugget of, of uh, life wisdom, 
Um, I worked with a guy who had to write an answer key for a gen chem textbook and he was miserable doing it. He spent eight to 10 hours a day, just working through problems by hand on paper and then typing up his solutions in a word document for eight to 10 hours a day or five days a week. Um, I like chemistry and all, but I can't think of many things I would rather do less than that. I'd rather dig post holes than do that. Um, so anyway, everybody have a good afternoon. Um, if you are, if you have lab today, um, show up to lab, give you a 15 minute introduction um, to get you started on it on one or two basic concepts and uh, then turn you loose on, on labster simulation. So I'll see you at 3.30 or on Wednesday. Hey, Sean, are we going to do that again? Because now I'm feeling a little just like <laughs> confused. You, you will get so much practice balancing equations. It okay. always is going to come back to just make sure you start and end with the same number of atoms. All right. All right. But we can maybe revisit that on Wednesday or at the lab. We'll revisit this one. I'll, I'll get the, a better a tricky but not wrong for, um, problem for us to practice on to build some confidence on. So yes, we will work okay. on that. Thanks, see you at lab.